I'd like to take you back to the music you listened to when you were a child, especially blues and R&B. Can you mm. tell us how old you were when you first heard those sort of records and what effect they had on you at that time? <coughs> well, I can't remember exactly. I think, I mean, I think I was around three probably. Um, but I, w I was sort of too young to know what it was. I didn't have a name for it. But when I heard blues and gospel, I mean, that's my earliest recollection about that age, but possibly before that even, you know. Yeah. And. Uh, you got to hear these, that kind of music because your father collected those sort of Well, yeah, well, he had the records. That was, that was it, really. So I, I grew up hearing this, you know, uh, and uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't really know any different until, you know, much later on. Um, you know, I, 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 a lot of the... Um, much later on, actually, because um, I think it was well into the 70s and 80s when I realised that, you know, people didn't grow up hearing this music, you know. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. I mean, presumably the kids that you knew when you were you know, in, growing up in Belfast, they weren't listening to John Lee Hooker and stuff like that. No, no, but there was, uh, you know, well, there's, you know, places that my father used to go, like the, you know, a certain record shop that, you know, that's, that sold jazz records and things. So uh, I, I would go there, and and uh, I, I suppose that people heard of it peripherally through Skiffle. Because that was related, you know, like Lead Belly, Woody Guthrie, that kind of thing. So, like my friends at school would would know it as that, not as the original thing, but as, as, as the you know, skiffle version of it or whatever, you know. Um, no, so it wasn't until sort of early '60s that that um, you know that well people started to take it on board. Uh, or it kind of sort of was, was, was seeping into the, you know, yeah. consciousness then. Of the, the blues and R&B artists that you listened to around that time, which were the ones who had, who meant most to you and what was it about your music that they liked, that you liked? Oh, well, um, most of, you know, most of the stuff I heard was well, um, Joyce, Joyce White, that was one of the first ones, um, Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, um, Lead Belly, uh, I think my biggest biggest influence was Lead Belly, I think, actually. Um, but he, um, I don't think at that time he was called blues or he was known as a blues singer. I think that he was more of a folk singer. And it was very, you know, it was broad ranging from blues, uh, jazz songs, uh, show tunes, um, and uh, like country and western. So, you know, he, he um, you know, he had a very broad repertoire, Lead Belly. I think he had the most influence on me. What was it about him that you that you really picked up on? Do you think? Well, just the whole, the whole sound and you know the the lyrics, the songs were very interesting. Um, that that was it. Yeah. The overall sound. Yeah. You know? What what about you know the um, Johnny Hooker, Muddy Waters, people like that? But that was that was a bit later. I didn't. Um, I didn't see any John Lee Hooker. I mean, I, uh, until um, like early early sixties, it would be. I first got um, hold of a John Lee Hooker record. I think it was. Um, but that 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 also had a, had a, a great uh, when I heard him. Um, that was like the second phase, I suppose, at that point. John Lee Hooker's Muddy Waters. Um, I'd had mud Muddy Waters before that, before John Lee, but they sort of um, had the same kind of impact on me. Because um, there was nothing else like that kind of music. I mean, you compare that with the other music that was on the radio. No, there was also well, the closest thing that I heard to that was it was a was a um, was an LP that Sonny Terry and Brian McGee recorded um, with with ele well, electric instrumentation, electric guitar, bass, uh, drums, piano. That was like a band sign, and I heard that before. I heard the Muddy Water stuff, but it was exactly the same. So Sonny and Brownie had been doing this, you know, way before it became called an R&B band or whatever, you know, um, which was popularized by, more by Muddy Water's band, Howling Wolf, and people like that. But they'd been doing that before, but it wasn't, um, you know, it, it wasn't uh, sort of framed in that way, you know. When you 
got into that music more? I mean, apart from Muddy and John Lee, other artists that appealed to you? Sunny Sunny by Williamson? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, I've heard Sunny by number one first. John Lee Williamson. Um, I heard his records first, um, and uh, um, I actually was, I think I was doing, I was doing one of his songs in, in, a, in a band. Well, we went to Germany. We were doing some boy stuff, early 60s. Then I heard uh, the other Rice Miller just shortly after that. I mean, the first single I bought was Bye Bye Bird by Rice Miller, Sonny Boy number two. Um, yeah. Yeah, he was also. I mean, all these people were a great influence on me, all of them, you know. Yeah, and sadly, still are, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he was a fantastic singer and musician. That's wasn't right, he? yeah, and, and, and lyricist. Yeah. yeah. Particular songs that you stand out for you? Uh, well, Help Me, that stands out because I still, I still do that in my set. I've been doing it since then uh, with various bands. Um, and there's one called Lonesome Cabin, One Room Lonesome Cabin. Oh, there's loads of them. Uh, Fattening Frogs for Snakes, um, Don't Start Me to Talking. So many, so many of them. Yeah. And there's a lot of wicked humour in those lyrics, isn't That's it? That's right, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was basically when you heard those John Lee and, and Muddy Waters and Sonny Boy Williamson, it immediately clicked with you that there was something there that you you wanted to do and you could do. Is that right? Or no, it was Lead Belly that clicked. That, that's that's what clicked was was when I when I heard Lead Belly and I was learning the guitar. <coughs> I was learning from the Alan Lomax folk book guitar method and uh, this kind of the Carter. It was called the Carter family style, and that that was the style that they were. Well, luckily, Lead Belly was using that style as well. Uh, so I was, I was learning from this book when I was listening to Lead Belly records, and he was playing the 12 string uh, in a similar style. And previous to that, um, I'd heard Jimmy Rogers before that. Um, so that's, that's kind of the area where I, where I came in. And then shortly after that, then Lonnie Dunnigan came along. Uh, out of the Chris Barber band with Skiffle, um, so it, it's kind of that's that's when everything, that's when I actually started to play. Uh, I, I formed a Skiffle group then, but I'd really uh, I'd be hearing this music and, and already learning this music previous to that, so it was, you know, I was just luck or something, you know, that this was happening at that time. Tell me about Jimmy Rogers. And I think for a lot of people today, they can't quite hear what's so great about Jimmy Rogers. It's quite crackly old records and stuff, yeah, you know. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. he is a great artist, isn't he? Oh, yeah, well, he's a good you know, songwriter, um, stylist, um, and also, um, uh, you know, Hank Williams uh, was another one. I mean, for me, Hank Williams was a bigger influence than Jimmy Rogers for me. Um, but that was something that I was hearing, uh, you know. Uh, there was a, a friend of mine that uh, his brother had these records and uh, you know he'd be playing these you know it might be Saturday afternoon you'd be walking down the street and he'd leave the door open and he'd be blasting out these Hank Williams records so it was uh, it was in a way going on all around me you know what I mean it wasn't like an isolated thing and then there's guys that used to get together on a Sunday afternoon and they used to play music out the back <clears throat> and this is pre-skiffle, you know, it wasn't called skiffle then, it was called folk music, I suppose. Um, so this kind of, you know, while I was into the blues and that, this, this other stuff was going on around me as well. Um, you know, so I kind of grew out of that situation, you know. Yeah. And then I added to it after when the other stuff came in, like Sunny Boy and the Chicago thing, kind of, you know, that was like the next step, you know. I, I didn't realise it went that way around. You, it was the folk and country stuff you heard first. And yeah. Then, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, no, that's what I played first. Right. But I'd, I'd still been listening to blues from my father's record collection. Right. But that's how I could put it into, you know, practicality was, was, was doing it, you know. Because there was, you know, there wasn't, there's no such thing as, a, you know, someone like a blues singer or a blues band. But there was, you know, there was country, there was folk, you know. What's, what makes Hank Williams one of the, one of the greats for you? Oh, I don't know, it's just, um, just the sound, the whole thing, the sound, the, the emotional delivery, uh, irony, you know, just everything. It's just, uh, I, I can't explain it intellectually, it's, it's just, uh, it's more of a feeling, uh, you know, 
the sign and the feeling of it more than, you know, like I couldn't, I can't, I don't, I don't think I could really explain what it is, you know, what, it, you know, why do some people like that and some people like other for I don't know. Yeah. I was just wondering with you whether it was the sound of the, 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 the voice or the music or was it the lyrics or, or everything, you know? Everything, yeah. everything. I just, I just felt like connected with it. It was everything. Yeah. yeah. People say, you know, the, the great strength of country music and Hank Williams in particular is the sort of honesty of the lyrics. Is that something that you felt? Or yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And that influenced yeah. you when you were starting to write, yeah? You to um, not, not right away, not right away. I didn't start to write until much later on. Um, you know, and then I was, I was only writing a few songs here and there. Um, I didn't really get into writing until actually about the 70s. You know, it was just a few songs here and there. I, I didn't, I, I wasn't, um, I didn't consider myself a songwriter until much later, you know. Yeah. So when you started off with the early bands, I mean, I'm sure you you had bands before them, I think, but I mean... Yeah, I was in uh, bands before yeah. them. And I had, well, I had the skiffle group and then I was in other bands. Yeah. I was in a rock and roll group. Yeah. Uh, it was like a four piece. Um, for several years, and then that that became a show band. The rock and roll group became a show band because all of a sudden groups were out of fashion, and and bands were in fashion. This is in Ireland at the time. And then with that band, we went to Germany and worked as uh, an R and B band in Germany. So that was way before um, uh, you know I made a record or anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the first records that you made were with, with them? No, the first record I made was in Germany with this band that was a show band that we turned into an R&B band when we got there. It was called The Monarchs, and, but I wasn't singing on it, I was playing tenor sax on it. I was took two sides that we made for um, CBS in Germany. Um, then the first one that I sang on was uh, them's first single, which was Slim Harpo song, Don't Start Crying Now. That's the first song I sang on. You've been seen on stage, presumably. Oh yeah, yeah for yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. For five years sure. before this. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, what are your feelings now when you look back on them as a band? I mean, did you? Was it a good period for you? That the, you had a lot of success, especially in America and Screaming Girls. No, and we the didn't. Rest of it. Did no, you we not? actually didn't. No, no, we didn't. That's a myth. Yeah. There's a lot of mythology around this now, and a lot of you know the grass are seeing through rose-colored glasses in retrospect about this stuff, you know, yeah. which is kind of perpetuated by the people that write, you know, the rock magazines and things, you know. But then it wasn't like that at all. It was extremely hard. Um, we didn't get paid, but we should have got paid, um, this kind of thing. Um, um, it was extremely, an extremely difficult period, to say the least. Um, and it wasn't definitely not pie in the sky, you know. No. no. But the first taste of, <coughs> of fame and adulation and all that kind of stuff. I mean, did, did, did you, how did you find that at the time? Um, well, I, I, I find that it was, it was all based around, you see, the TV thing. Um, you know, if, if, you were, if you appeared on TV, you know, then, then you were famous for a couple of weeks or something until the next time you're on TV, you know, that kind of thing. But I find it, uh, I find it um, that I didn't understand it uh, at all because... Uh, like having been in a band before that, um, when we were playing in Germany, for instance, which was much, much more disciplined and a better, a better group of musicians. Um, the them situation, I didn't, I didn't really understand. It was, I think it was more about selling and marketing and image or something than it was about music. Mm. I don't think it was about music at all, as far as Decca Records were concerned. Mm. Um, so um, it wasn't, it was only, for me, it was only like about an 18th month to two year time period um, and the band I was in before that I mean we'd been together for five years so it was you know yeah yeah but <coughs> that being said them made some great records as far as I'm concerned they did I mean do you look back on them as great records or not no not really I mean well some of them some of them I think were, were for then yes mm. I think you could yeah. say they were some of them were great records for then mm. yeah, yeah. Um, but, still, you know, you for me, that's where it ends. You know, you still, you, but you wrote some great songs then that you still do. I mean, "Here Comes the Night" and "Gloria." I didn't write "Here Comes the Night." That oh, was sorry, that was Bert Burns. Burns. I wrote "Gloria." Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Well, I mean, thank you very much. But the thing is, I mean, I think I've written better songs recently than that. And I see, that's the thing. Mm. I mean, I think my songs in the last five years are, you know, better than the songs I wrote, say, in the 70s or mm. 80s, you know. So, so, I mean, that's kind of where I'm coming from. But I understand that, you know, what I'm sure your preferences, you know, what your preferences, I don't know. But mm. for me, that, I mean, to me, it wasn't a. You know, it wasn't a great creative period, I don't think, for me, mm. you know. Mm. Yeah. When they said, uh, it's all over now, Baby Blue, for that, it, that was a song that I think you, you decided to put, if I'm told, you decided to put on the Greatest Hits collection. Was that, be, is that one recording you really do think stands up, or? Um, well, I put, the, I put on the ones that I thought stood up, mm. that, that made sense, and uh, I think that, that was making sense from the point of view at the time that I wanted to, um, I, basically, what happened, and that's it. I was just trying to sing, trying to be a singer. Um, you know, the, with this them situation, it was like, you know, it was like a group, and you know, everything was based around, you know, this group image, and you know, you know and which I didn't understand because I'd been in bands, and bands they work much differently than groups, as you know. So um, I just wanted to sing, so I would go and I would get stuff and bring it in. It's like, let's try this song, and you know, the rest of the people they didn't really want to know. So when I did Baby Blue, it was, it was, that, was, that was what was behind it. I was trying to get away from this format thing. And just this song, plain and simple, and just sing the song. Um, and that's where I was pulling away from it then, you know. Because mm. um, I was just trying to extend myself as a singer more. And they wanted to, you know, just have the image of like, you know, guitar. And, you know, yeah. feedback or something like this, which, you know, was we went on a you know different wavelength to where I was coming from. So, sure. um, I was just trying to improve myself as a singer yeah. at that point. You know? yeah. So you left them, and I think I'm right in saying you went to America. Um, no, not right away. I didn't right. go to America right away. Um, um, well, there was a lot of trying to. Um, well, we went to America as them, but I think there was only. From the second, the second there was like three of us left or something. From the four of us left from the second incarnation of them. It was called Them Again, and it was myself and another original guy, and then two other guys that were in Them Again. Um, I went to the states, and then uh, you know, same old story. We didn't end of the day. We didn't get paid. We worked like like practically every night for three months. At the end of it, it was like. Um, we owed them money or something, you know. At least that's the way it was in those days. So um, I, I was—I just wanted out, basically, because I wanted, you know, I was trying to, um, you know, have a more positive outlook than that, you know. Um, and so I, I basically left this, that situation then. But it was about a year before um, I think I made another record. It was about a, you know, on my own. It was about a year and. Uh, I was, I was in Belfast and I was doing like bits and pieces of gigs and then I went to Holland for about a week. I did, a, I did a, some gigs with a group there in Holland and then I was trying to get a record contract and uh, eventually ended up with Bert Burns again who produced the first demo album and he wrote Here Comes the Night. And that was a difficult period again, wasn't it, for you? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a very <laughs> difficult period of that. Um, we're, get, we're getting onto that. These questions about yeah. like TV sheets and and yeah. Brown Eyed Girl. There was a yeah, there was a question fourteen here. Yep. Yeah, see, that's what, what I would say. What I wanted to explain about this situation was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, although this was a hit record, you see, they didn't pay me, uh, and I was, uh, you know, basically. Um, on the bottom after that, because this company didn't pay me and I couldn't get any money, and um, it was yeah, it was basically a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, these people turned out not to be well. Like I explained it when I got there, um, we worked with Bert Burns in London, and and we liked him because he was fairly easy going, and it's just like. You know, do whatever you want and get everything on tip, blah, 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 you know, that kind of thing. Then when I got to New York, it was like Jekyll and Hyde. 
and there were all these restrictions in the studio and everything was really uptight and so it was a very strange period to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. And financially again you got turned over at that point. Exactly, yeah. 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 But all the same, how do you feel about those songs now, the Brown Eyed Girl TV sheets, those kind of songs? I mean, well, uh, Brown Eyed Girl I can't, I can't relate to at all and this is, this is um, this is what the bone of contention is because those tapes were bought by Sony Records and they keep putting this out like it's a new record. I mean, they put it out on various independent labels as well as Sony and they put it out every two or three months. There's another one. It's the same compilation, same song, same everything with maybe slightly different liner notes, different photographs, but it's all the same stuff and they keep putting it out and they're giving it blanket promotion. They gave it even more promotion than my new stuff on Virgin, you know what I'm saying? So, um, I mean, Brown Eyed Girl was, uh, that was then. And, um, well, uh, I, I got, the thing was that it was, uh, wasn't even something that I, I was doing in my repertoire. I mean, one or two years later, so, I mean, I, I, I just can't relate to that. And I, I mean, I can relate more to TB Sheets. For instance, something like that, because it's a different framework, and it's a different type of song, and it's like with blues, um, you know, which has gotten like it's more, you know, universal. But uh, Brown Eyed Girl is a pop song. It's not the best song I've written, and it's, it seems to be the thing that, um, you know, people are uh, remembering me by, and it's really bizarre um, because, as far as songs go, it's not my best song. Um, I've written much better songs, so it's yeah. sort of ironic that I needed that then, you know, at that period of time, I really needed that, you know, I needed, I needed the exposure, I needed the money, I needed all of that then, and I, you know, I, I didn't get it then, and, but certainly don't need it now. So, um, you know, it's, it's, Brown Eyed Girl is definitely a bone of contention, for sure. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's move on to a, a happier, I hope, phase of your career, and certainly a record I would imagine that you're a lot happier with. I mean, it's my favourite record ever, but I mean, uh, Astral Weeks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, can you, can you tell me how it came about? How, it had such an unusual sound. How did you arrive at that sound? Um, well, that, that, that came about because um, it was getting harder and harder to work with Burt Burns. Um, and, and the fact that they, you know, they, they weren't paying me. They were, well, they were basically they were paying my expenses. That's, that's it. And then later, well, they weren't actually paying my expenses because they, they were allegedly putting that against, you know, any royalties, but I didn't get any royalties. So, you know, um, that was just a struggle with them to do anything, with Burt Burns to do anything. Um, he was, I guess, had his own personal demons, and uh, which had nothing to do with me. Um, so it just became harder and harder to work with him. And this Astral Weeks came a bite of me just um, starting again, just like with a guitar, myself and a guitar, and building around that. And uh, I had a group with just myself, a bass player and a flute player. <coughs> and that's, you know, who I was um, experimenting with the songs with that format. So it came out of that. And then. Um, after several uh, wrangles to get away from Bang Records, which was Burt Burns Record Company, um, I got a contract with Warner Brothers through another production company, an independent. So I wasn't signed directly to Warner's. Um, so by the time I, came, I went in to make the, 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 the record, um, um, I had a lot of this stuff. I'd been playing it live. I was lucky to get some gigs like small time stuff, I, for instance, I played at the scene in New York, I got $75 a night, all in, that's everything. Um, that's paying the band, getting a taxi, the whole thing. So it was basic, it was basic, you know, on the bottom survival at that point. So Astral Weeks came out of that um, and um, playing these songs a lot, playing the material, experimenting with the material. And then when I went in the studio, um, it um, the producer suggested, you know, these jazz, mainly jazz players they were. Um, and he was right. He was right. So 
that's, that's the story. Mm. It's, um, as you say, they are, they are jazz players, but it's, it's pretty hard to put a label on it. It's hard to put a label on your music at all, but it has a completely unique sound. That, that yeah, album. well, it's a mixture of folk and jazz, I think, at the end of the day. Mm. Like folk, soul, jazz, you know. Yeah, yeah. But also, what makes it extraordinary are the lyrics, which is so different from any of the stuff you'd sung with them or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going deeply back into your childhood and a lot of stuff about Belfast and everything. Yeah, well, I wrote most of the songs in Belfast. It was uh, during that period between when I finished with them and then um, going solo. Um, I, I wrote them in that period, most of them. And then I wrote one. One was, I started to write in London, in Ledbrook Grove. I finished that, and then I wrote one of them in New York. So it was, it was basically about Belfast, about what I was picking up, and, you know, um, impressions, you know, during that period. Yeah. And did you, did you have a hunch when you were playing them live or in the studio that this was great material. Did you? Oh, yeah. yeah. You knew. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And the other the other players on the record, they they responded to the material. Yeah. 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 But then the record came out, and you know, did things change overnight? Did you start getting more? No, no, it wasn't promoted at all. Oh. It wasn't promoted, and and also these people I was signed. Also, this it was like from the frying pot into the fire for the third time. So the people I was signed with was an in the, they were an independent production company and they were they were they were at it as well. So you know they were leasing my tips to the record company, and, but the record company wasn't promoting it. They didn't promote it. Um, and I think I bet if I got a print out today of what Astro Weeks has sold even to date, the figures would be very very low. Um, Warner Brothers Records were not into promoting. Um, so, I mean, although the record was like critical, critically acclaimed, um, it wasn't it wasn't being bought in the shops because it wasn't in the shops. You know, it was uh, best kept secret. So, um, and yet they now got out by word of mouth or something. You know. Mm. Yet now, as you rightly say, not only critically acclaimed but regularly voted the greatest album of all time. Yeah, all. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's, yeah. uh, there's an irony in that, isn't there? Definitely. You know? yeah. yeah. So let's move on in, in your career. I mean, tape change, yeah. Nice, nice and quick. Is this okay? So you were saying a moment ago that you know your producer put you together with these great jazz players. I mean, yeah. people like Connie Kay and you know Richard Davis. Yeah, and yeah. really big names in the jazz field. Mm -hmm. Was it great working with them, or was it a bit intimidating, or what? No, no not at all, because they, they really made me feel comfortable at home. Uh, you know, when I um, when I was running down the songs with just myself and a guitar, they just picked up right away what was happening. I suppose because they they, just, they had such exp you know experience they had. A, was, you know, they played with, you know, I mean, Connie Kay, but, um, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd all been around the block a few times, so uh, they just made, made me really feel at home and uh, made it possible for me to just relax and do it. They made it possible, you know. And it was great, you know, and the whole thing was done in two days. It's incredible, really. You listen to the record. Yeah, well, that's was that's that's the way jazz records were made, and that's you know that's the way it was done then. Also, I mean, you know, I was used to doing it that way too. Yeah. Yeah. No overdubs or overdub with strings. Yeah, strings yeah. were overdubbed. Yeah. That was at another. That was like day three or something. You know. yeah. Yeah. And when you listen to the playbacks, you you felt you'd got what you wanted. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And more, yeah. and more, yeah. yeah. <coughs> the next album, Moon Dance. I mean, another. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
on an equally fine album, but with a very different sound to it, much mm-hmm. more, seems to me, anyway, listening to it more upbeat, a happier record. Is, is that right, or...? Uh, well, that was, again, that was, again, back with Basic Survival, but because I didn't get any money from the Astral Week situation, or very little, um, I, I basically was relying on my own, I had to rely on my own band because uh, Survival then was back to gigs, you know, it wasn't, um, I mean, having a record company didn't mean much if you weren't getting paid, so it was like, um, I, I, I formed a band in Woodstock, um, I got up there, and, and that was the band that I used on Moondance. I had started this project be, actually before, I actually started with Richard Davis, the bass player, who was the bass player on Astral Wicks, and I, I started that project with him. Um, but a lot, you know, the, the songs didn't really suit his style because they were different. They were different than the Astral Wicks songs, and they didn't, it didn't work out. So I just used my own band because I needed to keep them working. And also, the only way I could get paid then also was as a, as a session vocalist. Um, because um, as I was signed to this production company independently and they were leasing my tips to record company, the record company wasn't responsible for paying me. So the only way I could get any money because I couldn't out of this production company unless I sue them, or I didn't have the money to sue them. And the lawyer that I got to try and sue them, he took all my money and then told me that, I, you know, we can't sue them. All the money I had, which was like, you know, $100 or something. Um, so then um, I had to get, you know, put myself on the sessions as a, se- a, s- a singer. I had to go through the singer's union and that was the only way I get paid. So if I went in the studio for like say two, se- that's two sessions in a day, then I put in for two sessions, then I get paid for that. So that's the only money I got, right? Um, so basically I just used my band that I was starting to do small gigs with this band from Woodstock. And the, that's the band I used to record Windows. As you say, the songs were a different feel. Um, yeah. Much more R&B-ish, That's I guess. right, much yeah. more R&B. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Why did you decide not to carry on with the Astral Week style? Um, I don't know. I would have I would have liked to have continued with that, but the songs weren't coming in that framework, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's it, uh, again, I think a, a fantastic record and from beginning to end, but w- which are the tracks on it that you particularly like looking back on it? And the title track, presumably. Um, no, not really. It's not, it's not one of my favourites. I mean, I think, I th- again, again, I find it difficult to relate because um, I thought that was good then yeah. and it's a good album. Uh, but I can't, I can't really relate to the songs anymore, you know? I mean, um, one of the one of the songs is being used in a campaign now in the states, or some sort of campaign. I give them permission. Brand new day, yeah. off that. Um, but I, I just find it hard to relate to this stuff now. Yeah. Mm. Um, Does that go yeah. for the rest of your seventies stuff, really, or is there some of it? Yeah, most of it. Very, very little of it I perform live. Um, I, know that I Bobby can't think of any that I perform live now. Mm. I know Bobby Bland just recorded Tupelo Honey, for instance. I mean, that was. Yeah, well, I didn't. I didn't really know what to give them. You know, I really, I really wanted. Should have given them one of my new songs I've just written. I realized after we'd done it, um, but there wasn't a lot of organization going on that day. Um, and someone suggested that, you know, and I realized, well, you know, why am I going this far back? I've got. Some great new songs I could have put them on, so you know that's what happened there. Did just generally in the seventies in America? I mean, you, you became to the outside world anyway. A, a, you know, a big star for the first time as a solo attraction. Did things get better for you? You know, financially, or was it still the same? Well, they get they get better um, in the late seventies. In the late seventies, when they get better, yeah. Um, when I actually was signed with uh, Warner, Warner Brothers Direct, so. I, ha- I had to sort of, I had to sue these people that I was signed with, and I got I got a, I got management, so they helped me sue these this production company, and I think it was settled out of court, and I got out of that contract, and then I signed with Warner's Direct, and then after doing several records with Warner Brothers Direct, then I started to get paid, um, 
when I became my own production company. That's the point I started to get paid. Yeah. And, and I suppose right about that time, I mean, um, well, in the mid-70s anyway, you recorded Vida on Fleece, and I, I think you, that was in Ireland, wasn't it? You came back Well, I think that was trying to get back the Astral Weeks. I think that's what that was all about. Okay. Yeah. 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 But, I mean, for the first time, as far as I was aware then, there was an Irish folk element strongly mm -hmm. audible in the music. Mm -hmm. yeah. did, did you suddenly start getting into that music, or had you always... Obviously, you'd heard it growing up, but... I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, didn't, I, I don't know. I mean, it could have been unconscious. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of it, I, you know, I, I don't know why I did it, you know. I mean, there was, didn't seem to be, it just seemed to be a, a good idea at the time or something, or things were developing that way. Um, um, I, I guess there was no specifics. Um, um, I, I didn't... Uh, I just wondered whether you felt that perhaps the music that you had been making had been in danger of sort of, you know, becoming too... Rigid. Yeah. Well, I thought it was too... That's why, yeah, it was becoming rigid, so... I was trying... Yeah, more back to the folk element, that was it. That's what it was. I was trying to get more back to where I was, you know, left off in Astral Weeks and where I was trying to explore more the folk element. Because you know, I hadn't done that for a while. And... You know, I was just getting fed up with the racket again, you know, and everything having to be a production, you know. Um, I have a tendency, you see, to burn things out very quickly. So, for instance, like when, we, when I did Moondance, we'd already been playing a lot of that stuff live. In fact, a lot of it developed in the studio out of what we were doing live. So it's a matter of wheeling the band in and recording what we'd just done on a gig. So, Consequently, what happens is like I just burn things out, and I do a record, and I play it, and I play it, and I play it for that time period, and then I just burn it out, and then I and I go into something else, and then I burn that one out. That's kind of what I do. I, I you know I've got the attention span of a flea as far as that goes, so I don't really like doing the same thing all the time. I like to keep it moving and keep it changing, um, and and that's kind of what a lot of people don't understand, you know. But this is what the, my process is, this. Because I don't like doing the same thing all the time. And I get, I get fed up doing the same songs. So I think after that, um, when I recorded that Vidin Fleece, I was just fed up having a band. You know, I just wanted to start again and just keep it simple and make it folk music and acoustic and not have a band. Because I was getting fed up having a band all the time and, you know, seven to ten people and all this kind of thing. So. Mm. Uh, almost an orchestra, really. You were touring with a really big band, weren't you, just before that? Oh, the, yeah, the, well, the one I recorded with, yeah, um, well, live, I recorded live yeah. with the strings and all that, yeah. 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 Let's, let's move on to the 80s. I mean, I mean, you made, a, I mean, again, almost an album a year, I think, throughout, throughout the 80s, certainly a lot of records. And, um, I mean, which for, the, which for you was the, the one where you were most happy with, the one where you felt you'd really move forward with? All those albums. Um, when in the eighties? Yeah, yeah. Um, so common one onwards, I suppose. Really okay. Right. Well, I think I think common one was good. That was good. Because mm. um, that was. Yeah, I, th I think that I think that was going. To, I think I had a direction then. Yeah. I had some sort of direction, and that was good. That's the only one that sticks out, oddly enough, from that. Yeah. Yeah. Not poetic champions or. Oh, that that as well. Yeah, yeah. in a different yeah. way. Yeah. I remember coming one because it was it was done in all done in the south of France. At one place and it was done very quickly also. Yeah. Within a couple of days all the tracks were done. Um and there was some kind of it had some kind of vibe, for want of a better word, about it. Um but still still relevant, you know. And also the other one you mentioned, Poetic Champions, that that had a vibe too, but in a different way. I started that as a jazz instrumental album, yeah. you know? There's still and a couple of tracks on there that yeah. are... And then I had like three instrumentals and I realised, well, yeah. I'm not going to get away with a whole album of instrumentals, so yeah. I started to do songs. Yeah. I think that, um, I mean, you play saxophone a lot on that Yeah, record. that's right. Yeah. You, that was something you started doing really in the 80s again after... Um, yeah, I started from time to time, I started doing it, you know, when I, trying to get my chops back together. Um, and it's a matter of playing all the time. 
and I'd gotten more into playing at that period, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about singing. I mean, how difficult is it to kind of learn how to phrase things and know when you've got it right? I mean, is it something that's completely instinctive to you or do you think you've learned as you've gone along to, to, to do that and, and get better at it? Well, I think it's instinctive, but you also learn and get better. Yeah. You know, yeah. How do you learn? You listen to other people or you listen to yourself? Um, no, well, how, you know, what, what I had to do was break the boundaries of what, you know, the influence, like I had influences when I started, you know, and then I had to go beyond those and actually, um, you know, break, break them down, you know, or in, in a way to get them or whatever and uh, go around it, you know, uh, just did a whole, approach it a whole different way. Mm. And like my influence would be, say, from, from one of the very early influences, I say, you know, lead belly, country music, folk, um, through to singing-wise, so it would be Sam Cooke, I think that was my last, my last influence as a singer would be Sam Cooke. Um, but then, you know, I, I, I went further than that in my own way. I went further than that and phrasing and going in a different, coming from a completely different direction. Yeah. So I, I think that's, that's what it was. I mean, even though I didn't know what I was doing at the time, you know. Um, Bobby Bland, was he, was he an influence on that? Oh, yeah, 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 but, but um, as far as actual singing style goes, Sam Cooke, but Bobby Bland was also a big influence, you know. Um, but I'm just saying the last, you know, influence that, where I was influenced by singing style, you know, it was Sam Cooke. Which is... But I was influenced by Bobby Bland more like on a soul, le on a soul level. You know, mm. how, and how Ray you, Charles, of course, Ray Charles, fantastic artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, how do you think you've changed as a singer like you, from the days of them to now? What do you think? The, how would you put the, the change? I mean, it's, it's no, there's no comparison at all. Absolutely no comparison. I mean, there's not even any comparison between uh, where I was singing in the seventies, for instance. Uh, you know, to now because uh, my, my voice changed, um, it got deeper, and um, I, I only know this in retrospect, in the 70s I was singing in keys, because um, I mean, the people I was working with were suggesting these keys, for instance, that I was doing, the piano player would say, oh, well, let's do this one in E-flat, because he liked E-flat. So, you know, it was only years later I discovered that I was I stopped working in some of these keys, and I wasn't going as high, and I, I was my voice got gradually and gradually you know lower, um, and um, so I, I you know I don't sing anything like I was singing then. You know? Yep, um, Celtic folk and blues music. Is there a you know, a kinship there, something at a, a deep level, do you think, where there's a feel that's common to both of them? Or? Well, I, I, I don't know if there's, I don't think, I mean, there's a kinship, definitely. I mean, as far as, um, you know, uh, uh, feeling-wise, there's a connection, definitely, uh, say, between, you know, Celtic, country, western, blues. Um, I mean, someone once said that, I mean, country music was, was um, Irish music speeded up, you know? Um, but there is, yeah, there is, a, there is a connection. And actually, I'm probably not the best one to demonstrate it, but I actually saw this demonstrated by uh, Alan Stavell, a, a harpist from Brittany, where, where he, he did a, a 10 minute lecture on, uh, you know, music coming from Brittany and ending up in New Orleans. And, in between, so there, there, there is, there is a definite connection. But he's much more adept at explaining this connection. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, this, this spirituality thing. I mean, again, it's one of these things that critics always go on about and so on. But I mean, 
they say you're on a spiritual quest. That's been written yeah. many times. I mean, is, is that how it feels to you? Is that true? Well, I, I, not, not today, but I think I was then. Um, and that, that's the difficulty with this stuff. Um, you know, when, when you, you record something and then, you know, that's supposed to be set in stone. And it isn't. Because one moves on. Um, and I think then I thought I was on some sort of spiritual quest, you know. Yes, I did it, but I don't know. You know? Um, and I don't have the same... Um, I don't seem beliefs. Uh, I don't have the same naivete that I did then. You know. Mm. Yeah. You kind of went. It seemed that you went through a number of different interests spiritually. I mean, I think Scientology was one of them. One well, no, that wasn't. That wasn't a spiritual interest. So Scientology, was, Scientology was purely practical. It wasn't spiritual for me. Um, see, that's a subject that you can make it what you want it to be because it's, it's a broad subject. Mm. And it includes a lot, a lot of different. Uh, I mean, if you want it to be spiritual, it can be. I wasn't looking for that. Mm. I was looking for something else. Mm. Um, so for me, it was much more a practical thing. Mm. Mm. But I had been reading other mm. spiritual material mm. at the time. Mm. And inevitably, that does then feed through into the music. Yeah, I mean, you oh, can yeah, see that yeah, happening. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. it did for a while. Yeah, yeah. For several years, it, yeah. it bled through into the music for yeah. several years. Yeah. yeah. Let's move on to your, to your 90s output then. I mean, again, would you like to single out an album that you think it, you're really pleased with that hasn't been perhaps given as much 90s. attention? 90s? Yeah. Um, the last six or seven albums, say. Okay, well, I think, I think a lot of the songs from The Healing Game and, and also um, Back on Top, I think, um, um, is like, I mean, it's, it's only, well, was released a year ago or something, and it's still where I'm at. Um, so I think that would probably be my latest statement, would be back on top, mm. and it's still basically where I'm at, mm. you know, spiritually, mentally, whatever. Mm. Um, and I'm selling stuff off the healing game. And before that, um, the well, the one I did with just Georgie Fam, which we did for fun as a side project, how, how long has this been going on? Mm -hmm. That one. Yeah. That's a, that's a good it. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. The records you made with 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 the with the chieftains. I mean, were you, were oh yeah. Well, that that stands up. You know, mm. that's that's one of the ones that stands up to. Mm. Um, the one the one I did with the chieftains and and other other done other songs with them as well as for other other projects. Yeah. One of. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you when you're playing with something, something like the Chieftains, or like I know you've done recently with Lonnie Donegan, do you have to be seen differently from the way you would with, with, a, with a, a rock band lineup? I mean, what's, what's the difference for you? Uh, no, well, the thing with, it's a completely different approach. Say with the Chieftains, it's, it's a totally different approach. You have to, you know, it's, I suppose it's a bit like acting. You have to get into that particular, um, you know, way of being in that, in that music. Um, well, I know that from, you know, there's just the stuff I've been listening to and how I heard it when I was a kid, you know. Um, the first traditional group I heard was probably the McPeaks, you know. Um, so you just have to open yourself to that, you know, particular thing. And then, say with Donegan, that's easy. Donegan's easy because, I mean, I, my voice fits with Donegan perfectly. Um, and. So it's, it's very strange because most of the reviews that we got for the, the skiffle sessions, they were they were really over the top. I mean, much better than reviews I get for normally for a record. Um, when I release it, it was just all of them were over the top except for one, and there was one that I mean I don't know where this guy was coming from, but he said that our voices didn't fit together or something, which is complete hogwash because I mean actually Donigan actually thinks that our voices fit very well. So, I mean, if he does, well, what, what the hell is this guy talking about? But it's easy to sing with Donegan because we've, we, we kind of, I suppose we, we were both listening to the same kind of music at a certain time, and we were both influenced by the same person, i.e. Lead Belly, and all the stuff around that. So I find it easy to sing with him. Mm. For a long time, he was written off as being a bit of a joke, I suppose, because of the novelty records that he yeah, had. But, yeah, that's it. You know, he was an important figure, wasn't he, for yeah. a lot of Well, lot that's of it. Yeah. Well, that's it, and, and you know, and, and, and the thing is, you know, that, that he is a good singer. He's still a good singer. 
Uh, he's probably better now than he was then, you know. But so, but it's all a preference, you know. Um, and like that's a side project, and some of the things I've done, um, you know, try to get away from, you know, my mainstream stuff by doing side projects like that, you know, yeah. or like the Chieftains, yeah. you know. Yeah. This, uh, let's, we come to the end, but th this singer-songwriter thing, which, you know, began to be all the rage in the early 70s, I mean, how, when you first, people started talking to you about, about you in that way, did you feel part of that? Did that seem a good, dis I mean, obviously on one level it's an accurate description, but mm -hmm. is, is it a pigeonhole? You know? Well, I think that was a propaganda at the time. Yeah. It was at the time the propaganda, and I suppose for someone that had been, like, confined to like a role in a group, it was great then to be called a singer-songwriter after being in prison in this group situation, you know, where it was more like it had to be an image or something. So that was great for a while, but then that became, like you say, became a cliché and it was good propaganda for a while, uh, but then I realised, well, no, I'm not really that. I mean, I am and I'm not, you know, I'm, it's a bit like I'm, I mean, I'm more like Bobby Darren than Bob Dylan, if you want to put it that way. You know what I'm saying? Um, because I do the lot. You know, sure, I write songs. I'm a singer-songwriter. You know, I do other people's songs. I do jazz, blues, folk. You know, um, go as far as doing Sinatra or whatever. So, you know, I'm closer to Bobby Darren than I would be to singer-songwriter, even though he was also a singer-songwriter. So, yeah. you know. Sure. Because at that time in the 70s, people would group you together with some pretty unusual people. That's, yeah, that, that's right, exactly. That you probably didn't like being, being compared to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, we got to the end of the list of questions. Oh, and okay. we've covered a lot Good. more than, than that as well. <laughs> yeah. So it's really maybe intense. It's yeah. certainly a moment to stop and think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. anything you'd like to say? That, you know, that um, you no, I, I think there's probably more there than we needed. Yeah. I mean, that was... Yeah. Maybe I said too much. You know? No, no, listen, you can never say too much. I mean, you know it'll be edited and everything, okay. but, you know. Um, I don't know whether, just, we've got some fantastic stuff for the second program. I won't thought at the beginning while we were warming up, perhaps we didn't do justice to some of those early people, those early artists. I don't know whether there's anything more you'd like to say about Lead Belly or Jimmy Rogers or Hank Williams or anything like that. I mean, no, you no, kind of said what you can say, say really. Yeah, yeah. Say yeah. Um, yeah. I'll just throw some other names at you that I know we're going to be covering in that program that we haven't talked about. Big Joe Turner, anything? Does he feature in your... Yeah, well, I, 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 like, his, I like his songs. Yeah. Yeah. As a major influence, I, I don't know. I think no. I've, I've given all the major influences. You have, yeah. And also yeah. you mentioned Bobby Bland, which has been, you know, yeah, yeah, and Ray sure. Charlie, got those. Sure, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Good. Well, I think, well, you know, I think we've done it, really. I think we've done it. Yeah. Good. Well, that's well, it was a pleasure talking to you, man. Thank you very much. It was great. Nice, thanks. I really thanks enjoyed that. Thanks a lot.